not expect there to be a line to get in. Okay, so um, I am Professor Rosen. Uh, it's great to be back, even though, you know, it's a bit weird to be back in person. Um, so uh, this is 2168. If, you, if you're here, then you found the right place. And if you're not, I guess you're watching the recording. <laughs> So, um, hi, yeah, I figured it out. Oh, what was the problem? Oh, I had no idea where the HDMI cables were. Oh. And it turns out there's, they were under there, so. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, so. Okay, so a couple things about the class before we start talking about stuff in general. Um, so uh, first off, right, if you aren't aware, right, you need to get vaccinated. I'm sure you're aware at this point. If you haven't been vaccinated, you need to be vaccinated. Uh, the first vaccine needs to be received in, I think, 10 days, depending on your vaccine, on the vaccine of choice. Uh, I won't lie, the second dose sucked. I was, I had a fever for about it for, for a couple, you know, about eight hours later, but I'm also a wimp. So, um, but at the same time, it beats having COVID. So, um, all right. So what we're going to be learning in this class are generics, inheritance, array lists, time complexity, Stacks, queues, recursions, trees, heaps, Huffman trees, sorting algorithms, and graphs, and hash tables, of course. So um, simply put, there are basically three kind of levels we go through as computer scientists. So first is your 1051 10, uh, or 1057 plus your, 20, uh, your 1068, which is that we are learning how to take uh, problems and translate them into code, essentially take them and put them into some kind of algorithm. That is your, basically your CS1, as we call it. The ability to just think about uh, these problems, things like word problems we would typically have in mathematics, and just translate them into code for um, our, you know, so that the computer can do all the hard work, okay? And this means that we have to learn a lot of fundamentals about programming, but it's also just like an introduction to our problem solving in general. Step two is this, which is how in the world, if I've got a bunch of data, how does it get organized? And I don't mean that like, how do we put that in abstract ones and zeros? That's a different class. But honestly, I don't care because the computer does that anyway. And that's the hard part. And the compute and the people who wrote the compilers and interpreters so that the computer can do it are probably smarter than me in that aspect. So I'll, I'll defer to them. What I'm talking about is more of the uh, abstract kind of thought of how do we organize our data in terms of lists. So how do we like organize a list? What is a list? Uh, what about like if I have some hierarchical data or um, I just want to, uh, or I have, I'm trying to figure out what are the relationships between various pieces of data? How do I organize all that? And that's data structures. And at the end of the day, for a lot of problems, if you can just organize it correctly, that's it. That's all you need to do. That solves the problem. All right, so that's what data structures is. The third class, if you're comp continuing in computer science, is the data structures and algorithms. And that is, okay, well, what if that isn't enough? What kind of strategies are there for attacking problems? And what problems really can and can't be solved by computers? And what problems can be solved, but they take way too much time. Okay, so today, great. Like I said, you found the place and the time. Great. I don't know why I have to put that in the syllabus, but I do because I the way I find that out is the same way you find that out, which is to go onto the TU portal. You know, uh, same with your labs. Your labs are both on 9 a.m. and Friday. They're right right next to each other, um, and they're split up. I'm sure because of like room size requirements and things like that. Um, you will have TAs for those class. I've met them with the both. They're both pretty awesome. Um, 
I've, I've, I haven't worked with Bill yet, but I have worked with Jovan, um, and they do both have a working relationship with each other because they both have the same advisor. So, um, right. So you need to have a C or better in 1068. If you have a C, you might not be prepared for this class. And, um, so talk to me if that's the case. Um, so you do need a reliable laptop um, because you got a piece of technology and if the piece of technology is, well, you need a reliable computer. A laptop is preferable, but you need to have a piece of technology that you aren't going to be wanting to smack it against the wall every time you turn it on and use it because um, you will suffer um, mentally, physically, emotionally, and academically if your computer just doesn't work. Um, so um, also the, you know, the requirements for headphones and webcam, if you're sick or need to stay home, right, I will uh, just let me know and I will make sure to broadcast. Um, because if you're sick, don't come to class. I mean, that's true in any semester, but like for reals, if you're feeling sick, even if it's exam day, don't come. Just send me an email and we'll work it out, okay? All right, textbook is data structures, abstraction and design using uh, Java. It's a good textbook. I'm currently in the middle of writing a new one uh, for the class. But, and by a new one, I mean one that will be free. That doesn't help you right now, but any kind of feedback you have, let me know. Um, but it is a good textbook because we do go, you actually use the entire thing except for chapter nine. And the only reason I leave that out is because chapter nine takes a while. Um, so, so although that might change the semester, depending on the homework we do. All right. So um, if you need a sign, so office hours, um, I don't bother listing them because they might need to change later in the semester. But right over here, I, you know, you can click on this link to bring up the page to sign for office hours, or you can just scroll down because I figured out how to embed it. Um, so what you can do is you just select that you're in 2168, so that will come up with the appropriate T, uh, people, the appropriate TAs for me, and then you select who you want to, uh, who you want to meet with. Who's available to meet depends on, you know, what days you select. Um, so you can just see what what time, you know. And then that will schedule a 15 minute office hours. I'm doing my office hours online just because I, I, I don't want to be in the same space as you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's just for safety reasons. You're all great. Um, but if none of those times work, by the way, just send me an email and you know we'll work it out. These are just basically times that I'm there where you don't have to talk to me if you want to show up. You just book it and you show up. If you need to find some other time, we'll, we'll arrange it. Okay, and we can arrange that via, uh, you can send me an email or you can just, you know, send me an uh, invite on, say a message on Discord. I run a Discord for, for all my classes. So, you know, feel free to join that. There's already a bunch of students on there. Um, for those of you who don't know Discord, it's like Slack or Teams. It's a big chat room. Okay. Um, so let's go on to now the kind of most important, I've already meant about attendance, right? If you're having, if you're stressed out by this class or by classes in general, just, you know, feel free to talk to me about it. I'm not like a mental health professional or anything like that, but like I am a sympathetic ear and I can at least direct you to people who can. Okay. So, um, so yeah. And again, this goes on to both, like, if you're like, having issues with this course or other courses or issues that are preventing you from getting work done, the sooner I let you let, or if you're having medical issues or any kind of issue, the sooner you let me know, the sooner I can make allowances for it. Can't really do too much if you tell me you're having issues, you've been having issues all semester at the end of semester. But like, if like your housing situation suddenly changes right in the middle of semester, if you let me know, I'll be happy to help and like make allowances for that, okay? If you have a disability or some kind of accommodation that needs to be met, let me know via DRS. All right, recordings. I'll be recording my lectures. You're free to record, but you need to let me know uh, if you're recording. All right, so currently the grading for this class, I'll explain the curving uh, system of this later, but the curve never hurts you. Um, if you get an A, sorry, if you get a 90 or above, you're guaranteed an A. And then typically what happens is I use like the 88 and 89s to be uh, A minuses. That will, is what typically will happen. So 
the curve bumps people up up to the minus, if that makes sense. Okay, so quiz, so quizzes, those are self done quizzes. Like they're on Canvas, you take them on your own before the due date, and there's typically multiple attempts. They're literally there just to make sure that you are, you know, keeping up with the material. And that's, and they're unproctored. They're 5% of the grade, they're multiple choice, they're auto graded for the most part. So, you know, just do them and celebrate having 5% points free. Labs and assignments are the same things. In fact, we'll be doing those in class. Again, I'll discuss that in a second because this is a flipped class and I'll discuss that. Um, but that's almost, that's equal in equal weight to your, to your exams. Okay, so be sure to do the homework. You can't really pass without doing them. Exams, we'll have two of them. They're each worth a portion of your grade. And then we'll have a final exam, which is cumulative. Uh, we took, yeah, th they're worth a lot of points, um, but typically people do very well on the, typically my average on the second exam in the past has been like in the 90, sorry, in the high 80s, like 87 average. So for the second exam, first exam, it's like low 80s, 70-ish. So probably 70-ish, so that depends. And then the final just depends on the, on the class in general. So to turn in your labs and your homeworks, this is a two-part process. The first is you submit it online to Canvas to basically make sure that it's, we have a paper trail of you actually having done it. The second thing you have to do is demo it to me or TA in office hours during the lecture, because again, this is a flipped class, so there'll be plenty of time to do that, or um, you know, during the lab. That basically is a process of where I'm going to ask you to run it on your computer so I don't have to download it onto mine and try to figure out all the package issues that are going to crop up because that always happens because Java is terrible like that. It's great a bunch of things, but making it easy to download and grade, not. Okay, so um, and then you, I'll ask you questions about your source code and then I'll check it off um, for you. Uh, we do accept your late work. Um, your quiz and exams are going to be proctored, your exams themselves will be proctored in the lab. That way you have the full two hours to work on them. Okay. Um, okay, so we have, I have a different late policy for exams and exercises, and I have to fiddle with the exam late policy because what works for online doesn't necessarily work for right now. So just keep that in mind that that part will change. For exercises, that's not going to change. It's five points late, a point per day late. So with a with a minimum grade of 50 on it. So it doesn't matter how late you can you turn it in. As long as you've been you've been working on it, you you can get credit on it. That said, um you after you, you have 2 weeks after the due date to demo your lab. That's a soft rule, but the reason that is is because I had issues with students in the past, like one or two students each semester in the past who would just wait until the last week of the semester to try to demo everything and that was a very painful process because they often had errors that could have been addressed had they demoed it earlier and now it's the end of the semester and there's no chance to address it. So that's why that is there. Um, obviously, any kind, obviously these rules are all flexible in like with medical issues and stuff that can crop up because uh, we live in these turbulent times. All right. So um, I, in, the, in general, I had a late policy that for exams, which was like a 10th of a point per minute late for exams. That's not really gonna work for our exams this semester because of um, the fact that you're in a lab and you're gonna be scurried out of the lab once the, uh, for the, to make room for the next lab once your lab period is done. So we'll figure out how to handle uh, uh, lateness on the labs. But in general, you know, I try not to penalize people turning it in the exam late too much. All right, so let's see, did I completely skip over the uh, flipped classroom bit? All right, let me talk about that now before I talk about the academic honesty thing. So this is a flipped classroom. That means that you're going to be, uh, that means that in the upcoming weeks, I expect you to watch uh, lectures online before coming to class. And then the class in turn is now dedicated to do, completing your projects and your homework and doing some in-class exercises. Um, this may sound like a bit of a drag, like why do I have to, it, why, why am I watching videos? Isn't it your job to lecture to me? And yes, I, I lecture on the videos. I made the videos um, and I did, and I put in a lot of effort to do them. Um, so, but now since you're here, right? So the difference between you and me when we, pro, when we program is that I failed a lot more than you. 
I have made way more mistakes than all of you be just by dint of having been programming for a lot longer, right? I've been programming for a lot longer, therefore I've made more mistakes. So I know how to fix those mistakes when they crop up. Furthermore, I've seen all your fellow classmates that make, make that same exact mistake. You are going to make a lot of mistakes. You're not dumb, you're just human. Or maybe you are dumb, but in that case, everybody is dumb, okay? Like we're all human and we're all dumb, get it? So, so it's not a problem. So don't tell yourself that it's a problem with you personally. You're just a human. Okay, and humans like to see what they think they're seeing. It's just the way where our minds are wired. So it, it's like on your, um, it's like when you're reading a sentence and trying to count how many words there are, and then you realize there's two thes in a row and you only read one. Okay, we like to see what we expect to see. Okay, so what does, so what does this relate to a flipped classroom? Well, Rather than banging your head against the problem for three hours, you can come in and I can fix that problem in about three seconds, you know, so by doing things in class, it's a much easier way to, to do this. Some of you may not have brought your laptop today. That's okay. Right. Um, and if you don't have a laptop or can't don't have the to work, something to work on in class, that's also okay, because I encourage pair programming. Okay, I encourage you to work with other people. Although with COVID situation, it may be a bit weird to do that. So, but um, regardless, we can, um, but regardless, this time is gonna be dedicated to, our lecture time will be dedicated to working on these problems. And in fact, these are going to be more lab periods, but with, poss with some extra stuff thrown in. Um, I found this works very well and students have reported that they like this a lot, not to mention my, my videos, right? Typically, I'm, I'd be lecturing for two hours and 40 minutes a week, right? And I don't think I do, I tend not to do more than two hours in the videos. So it's a bit less to watch, mainly because I did multiple takes and I polished them. And this is the second batch of recordings that I've done. So um, now, where are these recordings? You go over to modules, right? And we have all this stuff. By the way, like this is a good overview done by Crash Course, which is a great YouTube channel. Um, they've, and which is kind of a big overview in 10 minutes of what we're gonna be covering in the entire class. So um, there's also an extra credit because, you know, it's the first week, you have nothing to do, might as well do some extra credit. It's worth 15 points um, for you on, added to, on top of your hope overall homework. So where normal assignments are worth either somewhere between 100 and 150. So. Um, not bad, and it's useful. Um, but typically what you'll do is that you'll go and you'll just see in the modules that we have for this week, we have object oriented programming videos uh, this first week will general will be stuff that is not shouldn't be too new for you. Um, and the second week is only going to be somewhat new. To you. Um, this is part because you know there's typically a gap between semesters where you haven't programmed be it a couple weeks or a couple months so. Um, this one will basically just be reviewing object oriented uh, concepts like inheritance and uh, and the like. Um, and we'll be doing an, an operation to go over this. The next week is going to be over array lists. Now you may be thinking that, yeah, wait, we did array lists in Professor Fiore's class. I'm sure you did, right? So don't know if it changed over COVID, but you probably learned how to use them, but not necessarily how they work internal. So the first assume and and if you're coming from a different class, maybe transferred in, you may not have learned array lists. So basically the first half of the video is over here, talks about how we use array lists, but also I talk about how to use them with generics, which you pro which I know Professor Fiore probably doesn't do, which is how you make array lists of integers or array lists of strings. In other words, an array list that restricts the types of stuff that you can put into it. Um, and then the second batch of the videos is, okay, well, now that I know how to use it, how does it actually work internally? How do we actually build it from scratch? Because a lot of this is how do we build a lot of built-in stuff from scratch? Um, and my, my solutions will be different than the way Java actually does it, but I aim for readability and understandability rather than trying to do some programming hacks because it's the theory here that matters rather than the optimization. Um, okay. So that should be the so that should give you the general gist that basically each module is roughly equivalent to a week. Okay, our weeks will gen will so our exams will be 
I'm not going to give you specific dates necessarily. This is week one. Our first exam typically takes place on week five or week six. Typically, it happens on week six. And then the next exam will happen on week 10 or 11. And that just depends. Okay. So, in other words, it, you'll have an exam each third of the way through the semester, in other words, which makes sense because you'll have your first exam, your second exam, and then your final exam. Okay. Um, so once you get to module four, by the way, I'll mention this now, uh, you'll have your choice of doing two different assignments. Okay. There's the, you can do either, either or doing both will take a while. Just choose one is easier, one is harder. And it really just depends on what kind of challenge you want. Okay. So going back to this academic honesty. So this was a bit of an issue last semester because we had a lot of stuff that was done online. Um, I sent out between 1051 and, and 2168. And although 1051 typically has like five times as many students, I had sent out about 14 academic dishonesty uh, forms. I am not dumb. Uh, we, I am a, from, plagiarism detection is an assignment I could, I could make you do in a computer science class like something to write plagiarism detection. Uh, furthermore, like, I, I like games. I really like games. And part of liking games is that I like looking at rules and seeing how I can exploit rules and, and find not loopholes, but basically allowances in the rules. So I'm very good at seeing what is good in the rules and what, break, and what breaks the rules. So I know what breaks the rules and I'm very good at identifying things I've seen before. Um, for instance, there was one question on my exam last on my final exam last semester where I told students, hey, it's open book, open note. It's on, you can even use the internet so long as you're not communicating with other people. Don't go to check because the answer you might find because the because trust me when I say the answers you'll find on check are wrong. Some students went to check. They copy pasted the answer there. The answers all had the same unique mistake. So, you know, I, um, there's also an assignment I often see lifted from geeks where somebody lifts something from geeks for geeks uh, um, without citing it. That's generally my thing. Like I'd be less angry if you just cited it because then it's not plagiarism because you're not misrepresenting somebody else's work as your own, right? Um, so this just goes to say my, so not to scare you too much. Okay, I just have a, I try to be reasonable about these things. Okay, um, in fact, I encourage you to collaborate with others because the best way to learn this is to teach other people. Okay, so here are the rules of thumb. Um, if you're, uh, if you have a doubt, just don't do it. You can always ask me and I'll be happy to tell you and there's gonna be no hard feelings. Okay, um, and if you feel like you violated something and you have, um, and you have an issue, right? If you feel you committed, you had a violation and let me know within 72 hours without me having to bring it up, I'll probably be a lot more gentle on, on you about that. So, all right, what, are, what, are, what is reasonable? Talking with people about the assignments in English or any other language, including Klingon, Elvish, and Esperanto. So um, discussing the course's material with some with others, even people who are not in the class in order to understand it, helping somebody identify a bug. So this is one of the things, uh, like if you're showing somebody else your code, but the purpose of, the, of you showing somebody else your code or posting the code on the, the code on the Discord is saying, I have a bug, I don't know how to fix this. This is perfectly acceptable, okay? Um, you know, so helping a, a classmate identify a bug in his or her code uh, in person or online by viewing, compiling, or running his code, even on your own computer. Don't care if you have somebody else's code on your own computer, but the sake of it is that basically that you are fixing a problem. The issue becomes if somebody like, if you're going like, I don't know how to do this. Can you send me your code that's, you know, done? And they say, yes, that's the issue, right? So, uh, in other words, if you're the person who needs help, showing your code is, is okay. So incorporating a few lines of code you found online or elsewhere into your own code, provided those lines themselves are not the complete solution, right? So don't like lift, if you're trying to do something, like, like if you find a solution to one of my homeworks online and you just copy that wholesale, that's, 
I'm just going to tell you to do it yourself. Oh, and you got to cite it. That's the thing. If you cite it, you're not going to get in academic trouble because it's not plagiarism, right? The worst I'll tell you is to do it again. Yes. When you cite something like that, you cite it in the code as a comment. Exactly. You cite it in a comment. That is the that is the standard way to do it in in programming. All right, sending your showing code you've written to someone else. Again, I've gone over that. Sharing your own look, posting on Stack Overflow, in other words, or on the Discord. That's perfectly okay if you're trying to get a bug fixed. Uh, going to somebody else, but so long as it's not for an outright solution. Uh, putting problems on a whiteboard, that's okay. Working with or even paying a tutor to help you, even so long as the tutor's helping you and not actually doing it. Okay, what's not reasonable? Uh, going online and just finding a solution and then basically resubmitting it as your own work. Uh, asking a classmate to for their solution, not cool. Um, basically finding some compiled code and trying to decompile it to get around it rather than doing the work. It's not, this is not that class. All right, so failing to cite with comments, the origin of codes or techniques you, you grab outside of class. So failing to cite code online that addresses this policy. So, so if you find a question on ex, for an exam online and you write, and again, this was because the exams were open online because I couldn't really do anything about that when we were, <laughs> you know, online. And you just fail to cite it would violate the policy. Finding a code online that you think might address the problem uh, and then blindly copying and pasting it when it doesn't actually solve the problem at hand is a great way to violate the, pro the policy and make me angry. Um, nothing gets me a bit more annoyed than basically copying pasting code you don't understand and then not citing it. Um, and so, for example, the problem with 1051 is that I had them do a Monte Carlo approximation, which is just a fancy way of saying I had them simulate something a bunch of uh, 100,000 times of a game. So I had them program a game. And uh, the game was, uh, it was just a simple child's board game, but there were two versions of the game. There was one for toddlers and one for kids. I asked them to approximate to give me a solution for the one for toddlers, and they searched Monte Carlo game name, and they found the one for kids, blindly copy pasted that. They both had different pieces different and different amounts of rule sets. So yeah, it was pretty obvious. Um, also, a bunch of people had submitted the same exact thing, right? All right, so paying somebody else to do the work, searching or soliciting outright solutions for the problem, not great. I think you get the idea here. In doubt, just ask me. All right, so I think I've droned on and on about, about you being my enemy of, of you know for a while. You're not. Again, my big thing is just cite your darn work, please, if you find it online. Stack Overflow exists, Wikipedia exists. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pretend it doesn't otherwise. Uh, sites like Homework Helper or Chegg or stuff like that, they exist, but they suck. They're not good. Trust me on that one. Okay. They just aren't going to give you quality solutions. And if you're having trouble, I'm here. For God's sake, just ask me. I will make sure you get through the homework. Okay. Like it's literally my job to help you. You know, so, and, you know, if you're not understanding something, again, see previous statement about you being human. I will make sure that it clicks. It's my job. Okay. All right. So with that said, what in the world is our um, is our first assignment? First off, any questions about like the way the course is going to run? Okay. Let me go back to Zoom and reshare my screen because I shouldn't have stopped sharing yet. Okay. Here we go. So let's go to the first assignment, Fox and Rabbit. And let me go ahead and boot up IntelliJ while we are at it. So, um, so you'll see there's a PDF and a zip file. You'll want to download that zip file for the for this assignment. Okay, and then what we can do is I'm just going to drag this onto my desktop. Okay. Okay, unzip. Let's see, extract all. Yeah, I'm currently playing with the uh, Windows 11 beta, so that's why my UI looks a bit different. Okay, so here we go. New. 
So I use IntelliJ. You can use whatever the heck you want, um, be it Eclipse or um, or what's the other one? NetBeans. Don't really mind what kind, or you can use VS Code. I really don't mind what you use, just so long as it works for you. And if you need help getting it set up, I'm, again, that's a question I'm more than capable of helping you uh, help, helping you answer. I like just IntelliJ because it does a lot of the work for me. Okay. Go ahead and put in this window. Okay, so the main thing about an IDE is that if you're using an IDE, uh, it likes to have things organized in a very specific way. So what you're going to want to do is take all these Java files and put them into the SRC folder of your project. Okay, if you're using an IDE. I know if you were doing Fiori's class, he probably was doing, I think, Mimir, right? Right, so if, so you'll want to download and install IntelliJ. If you need to, I can send out, if I need to, I'll send out instructions after class on how to install that kind of stuff because I have videos for basically everything. Um, so, and there they are. And what you'll see is that they've got C symbols to indicate that it is a Java class, okay? So this is a fairly big program that we've just imported in which makes it look really intimidating. One of the common themes in this class is that things don't, aren't as difficult as they first appear, okay? So for instance, the, while this is a large class, you're only ever gonna be working in one of these classes, in one of these files, which is the rabbit class, okay? So, and if you need to refer back to the, uh, to the assignment, you know, I've got this big PDF, but I'm gonna pretty much go over everything I need to in the PDF. So there's two classes with main. Uh, the first is the grader, which runs this program 300 times and gives you your grade. Um, right now, if you run it, it's gotta compile right now because it's building it. So give it a second and it will finish it. Okay. And it says, I the rabbit escaped one time out 300, which means nothing to you at the moment. And it says that you've got a zero on this because of that. So, Let's go ahead and run the rabbit hunt, which runs a one, a single simulation of this. And so we're going to run it and, oh God, it's a GUI. That's right. But don't worry, you don't need to know anything about graphical programming to, to deal with this. This is a, I will explain the model view controller model to help you, to help you get through this, but nothing shows up at first. That's just the way that newer versions of Java work with the old code that this is based off of. And we can hit run and we see that we've got a small a field. So this is not a Pac-Man field. This, if we go, um, and so if we try to go off the edge, we're going to bump into a wall, right? We don't go around. It doesn't wrap around like it does in Pac-Man, right? This is a bounded field. So there are essentially um, four objects. We have the wall, a four-mentioned wall, or sorry, the the field. The board consists of uh, is a grid consisting of basically surrounded by walls and has three different things on it. We have the small yellow dot, which is the rabbit, the big red dot, which is our fox, right? I guess, I, I mean, I know they're not rabbit and fox shaped, but I mean, they're easy to look at. And then we've got these green blobs, which represent bushes, okay? So it's pretty simple. The fox's job is the fox wins a game if it chases down and lands on the same square as the rabbit, which is the fox eating the rabbit because that's what foxes do. They eat rabbits. See Zootopia. Um, so, all right. So now um, the rabbit escape wins the game if it survives for under hundred turns. If it so, if it survives for hundred turns, it will win. So there are a couple things that work. So first off, we can do this step by step, and we see that basically when I hit the step button, we see these kind of lasers shooting out from the fox. Um, this is part of a function that it's that it's calling called the look function, which saying that it looks in a certain direction. And we see that the that the look function, the line of sight that it has is first off, it only works in straight lines according to the grid, and it's blocked by the bushes. Okay. Now the fox's strategy, you can look at it right here, which is that it has a bunch of variables saying, have I seen the fox? Can I see the, sorry, can I see, have I seen the rabbit? Can I see the rabbit now? How far am I? What's the direction to that rabbit? And current direction. Notice that those are integers. Um, their model has a bunch of like stuff, has a bunch of named variables like north, northeast, east. So you don't have to remember, wait, is one north or is zero north? It, you know, 
So you can just simply say model.n if you want north. Okay, so useful functions like that. But let's go back to Fox. So what the Fox does is that we can kind of, I'll just kind of briefly explain the code, even though there's a lot of stuff going on in this. The first thing I do have to talk about, though, is my choice of font, which is, I believe, which is that I'm using a font that has ligatures enabled. So you'll notice that I have a less than or equal to sign, an actual gosh darn less than or equal to sign in my code. I actually don't. That's the, the screen is lying to you. If I hit a space, you'll see that it's a less than or equal to sign. And what's going on is that when, it, when it's next to each other, the font just simply extends that across two spaces and make them less than or equal to sign. I find that more readable. Some students find that really annoying, but it's my computer. So um, we also see that if we've got a double equals, that becomes a fat equal sign. Um, and how is that working? Well, sometimes in a font, when you've got a font, you've got, you'll notice like if you're typing in Times New Roman or something like that, if you put an F and an I next to each other, so depending on the font, the top of the F will like cover the dot on the I. That's like a ligature thing that's built into fonts and how they work. And this is just simply exploiting it to make font, to make coding ostensibly a bit more readable, make it look a bit more like mathematical statements. So, okay, so don't get too confused about that. So let's see this. So the main way this works is the decide move function. And that's where you're gonna focus on, on your work. So I should indicate the one rule that I have in this class. The only code you're allowed to modify is in rabbit. Okay, that is the restriction. Otherwise you could just simply code the Fox to make it do nothing, right? And then the rabbit do nothing and then you're done. So no, you're only allowed to modify the rabbit class. Okay, the other option, the, well, with one other caveat, you can change the number of trials in the grader to up the number of trials you have to make the grade a bit less swingy, you know? Sometimes 300 is not necessarily a big enough sample size. Okay, so the way this, so each turn, the Fox, so first off, let's start at the top and just remind yourself, Fox extends animal. That means that we are establishing one of two relationships, right, in Java. You have a is a and a has a relationship. We have a lot of has a's here. The fox has a Boolean. Have I seen the rabbit now? It also has a second Boolean and it has three, in, uh, three integers to keep track of. But the more cool relationship that, that object-oriented programming allows us is the is a relationship. The fox is an animal, which gives it access to all these uh, useful things in the, animal in the animal class, like the look function. Uh, by the way, I should have asked, can everybody see this or do you need me to up the font size? Okay, cool. So, so look, so this finds the first, so what does the look do? It finds the first vi uh, visible thing in the given direction. So it says, what is the thing I see in this direction? What is the first thing I see? And you'll get either back a bush, a fox, a rabbit, or a wall. You know, depending on what what it run, what the laser beam I run is into. You know, um, you also have a distance which says, okay, there's something in in this direction. I don't care what it is. We have a function for that for what it is. I just want to know how far away it is from me. That's the distance function. We also have stuff like can move, which asks, can I move in this direction? And you might not be able to because you know there's a bush in the way. You can't go into a bush, or and you can't go you know past a wall. So let's go back to our Fox class. So the way the Fox works is that he's at the beginning of each turn, he says, okay, I don't know if I can see the rabbit because I haven't looked yet this turn. Now I'm gonna look. For int i is equal to model dot min direction. So min direction being like that's north and that's gonna go clockwise into all the directions. I is less than or equal to max direction. That way you don't, again, have to remember that the directions are zero to seven, right? min direction to max direction, I plus plus. So we just simply loop through and we are gonna do this on every single of the eight directions that we can do. And this says, if look I is equal to model dot rabbit. So in other words, if I look around and I see the rabbit in direction I, then I'm gonna execute this block, which is simply saying, I see the rabbit, I get the, I get the direction to the rabbit and I keep track of the distance to the rabbit. Okay, makes sense so far? Then we, so now that once the for loop is done, I move on and saying basically, if I have seen the rabbit at some point, 
not necessarily this turn because the rabbit is a tricky rabbit. Rabbits can be tricky. If I have seen the rabbit, if my distance to the last known location of the rabbit is greater than zero, in other words, if I'm not where the rabbit should be, I just move towards the last known location of the rabbit, okay? So how do you move? You return the direction you want to move and decide move. That's how you move. You say, I want to go in this direction. If it's not a valid direction, you just stay still. If it's not a valid move, you'll stay still, okay? Otherwise, if you go to the rabbit, if you've lost the uh, rabbit because like, you know, you lost track of it somehow, you saw it, but now you no longer can see it and you've got to the last known location, you just choose a random direction, okay? So, so basically what it does, so basically it looks around, if it sees the rabbit, it makes a beeline towards the rabbit. If it has seen the rabbit, it still continues going towards the same last known location of the rabbit. If it's never, if it's not seen the rabbit anytime soon, like, oh, I'm right, if it can't, if it loses track of the rabbit, it sets that to fall, so it doesn't keep going in the weird direction. So if it, if it has no idea where the, ra uh, where the rabbit is, it paces around. Basically it will move forward, try to move around an obstacle, that's what this can move model.turn. By the way, model.turn is possibly the most useful function in this entire thing because it means you don't have to make eight statements. It means you only have to make one. What do I mean? You don't have to make a statement for each direction. Model.turn basically allows that to be a bit more abstract. Okay. So, okay. Let's see. So now, so we can see this behavior um, over here in this Java program where basically it hasn't seen the rabbit. And it, see, it's pacing right now, it went back and now it sees the rabbit and makes a beeline. And it lost track of it. Oh, found it again and there. So here again, we're gonna see this pacing behavior where it's moving diagonally and it goes around that obstacle. Oh, sees the rabbit and now it makes a beeline towards it. And then the rabbit jumped on. That's a stupid move for the rabbit, right? Okay, now why, so let's go ahead and look at the rabbit's code. Oh dear. So uh, I think we all can kind of understand what this does. Um, it moves random. This just simply means that the rabbit moves randomly. Um, so the ran so you need to do much better than random. So let's go ahead and modify. We can modify this by the way. But this is what you're modifying. For instance, if I wanted the uh, rabbit to stay still, I could just simply say return model.stay. So I'm going to stop this program and now I'm going to run it. And now, no matter what happens, the rabbit is just going to stay still, which might actually perform a bit better than just moving at random. I mean, it's still going to get eaten like, like nobody's business, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, so how do I do better uh, than this? So in general, there's two strategies you can do. Um, there's two strategies, the easier one and the harder one. The easier one is to exploit the whole fact that this is a line of sight operation and asynchronous, okay? So in other words, we take our turns asynchronously, which is to say that the rabbit moves and then the fox moves. The rabbit moves and then the fox moves. So what I can do is, and but the rabbit, the fox, so this fox is only ever going to um, move towards the rabbit if it can see it, and it can only ever see in line of sight. So, um, I knew I forgot something. I didn't bring the pen. Okay. You know, it was switching bags because, yeah, I know how whiteboard works. Okay, so let's see. All right, so let's go ahead and say that this is our fox, right? And he can look in this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, right? He's gonna be looking in all these directions roughly because I'm, and I say roughly because I'm terrible at drawing, okay? But let's go ahead and use a rainbow pen here. But like this entire cone over here, and this entire cone over here, that's a giant blind spot for this box, right? So if you're a rabbit, the way you're, the easy strategy for doing well, and this can get you into a high 80% survival rate, is fairly simple. 
if I'm a rabbit, stay still until I see the fox. If I see the fox, move into a blind spot. So in other words, just be completely reactive. Only move if you can currently see the fox. If you can't currently see the fox, don't worry about it. Okay, this is, works into the high 89% survival rates. The harder strategy is from MMORPGs, which is the kiting strategy. Now, for those of you unaware, the kiting strategy involves a party of, of players taking down a monster. Um, and the way this works is that basically one player goes, look at me, look at me, come and eat me to the big scary monster. And then he runs. He runs like crazy. While the, uh, while the remaining players will basically typically use uh, damage over time effects to basically run out the clock on it, on, on it. So like the enemy will be poisoned and you wait for the, uh, the poison to take effect without actually engaging. It's, uh, it's not as boring as it sounds because, uh, because there's a good chance of actually being eaten if, if the person running around doesn't, you know, <laughs> if he crashes into something. Um, but so simply put here, right, you're moving at the same speed if you can pilot this, if you can have some kind of a, amount of if statements to pilot this rabbit, ostensibly you could weave around and not worry about something. I tried that strategy first and I got the 40% and I had, my issue was going around corners and uh, obstacles. That was the hard part for me. But I found exploiting light of sight to be uh, very useful. Now, some of you may say, okay, I'm just gonna copy and reverse this code. Honestly, there's only one bit of code here. You don't need this. This is predator code. Prey code is much simpler. A good solution takes about 10 lines for this, for this program. Um, what I can do here is that I can, um, the only bit that's useful is this for loop, which is basically saying, okay, um, if I go into rabbit, which is saying, look in all the directions, and then if I see the fox, do something, move away from it. That's basically it. Your code basically should look like this if you're doing the first strategy, which is, if you see the fox, move directly away from it. So a good place to be, if you wanna like be set up with this, is this won't work at all. You're gonna still get a zero percent survival rate. But a good place to be to demonstrate that you've kind of mastered the fundamentals of this is if I see the fox, move directly away from the fox. Okay. Now, how do I move directly away from something uh, without having like eight if statements, right? If I if I'm if I see if I see the fox and I is to the north, then move south. That would be a pain, wouldn't it? Right? Don't do that. That's terrible. We have a function. Well, first off. Remember, each of these are integers. And the reason for that is that in it, that integer arithmetic can be modular. Uh, but again, that's a pain for you to figure out. So fortunately, we have a function in here called the turn function. Uh, the model.turn, which given a direction and a number, gives you the number of 45 degree turns clockwise. So in other words, if this is direction I, the direction I'm currently facing is direction I, because you're going to pass in direction I into the first field. Okay, that's always what it's going to be. If I pass in direction, if I pass in one, the resulting direction will be this, a 45 turn this way. Two would be this, three would be this, and four would be this, directly away. And five would be away and to the left. Make sense? It's all relative. It works. It doesn't matter if it's diagonal or not because the program doesn't care, really. Okay. So model that term really helps you. It does all the all that nasty mod math you can see here for you. So you don't have to worry about that. Plus modular arithmetic is useful, but it's also not something we've been trained with since grade school, except for when it applies to like time, you know? And even then that's still hard to work with. Okay, so I think we still have about half an hour left. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to is I'm going to shut up and I'm going to help you get set up on your project on your laptop if you need it. If you don't have a laptop, um, then that's okay. Just you can, you know, pair up with somebody who does, make friends with somebody who does. And uh, again, 